Hey, good morning, Grace Baptist Church. It's great to be with you this morning. I'm um, just so thankful uh, to have this opportunity and privilege to be with you. Today, we're going to continue Mark's and Matthew's Gospel. I'm sorry, we we're Mark yesterday. Matthew's Gospel, uh, Matthew chapter 12, uh, verses 46 through 50. Um, so today, we're going to look at Jesus addressing his family and his relationship to his family. So let's ask God to bless our time together and see what God has for us this morning. Father, we thank you. Um, so much for allowing us to open up your word this morning. Uh, what a mercy it is that you've revealed yourself to us. You've revealed your word, your desires to us. Uh, such a, a wonderful uh, condescension, such a wonderful communication to us who don't deserve it. We thank you for it, Father. Help us to embrace these words as words of life. Father, teach us and instruct us guide us into obedience. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we're looking at Matthew chapter 12, verses 46 through 50. I've entitled this lesson, Family Matters. Family Matters. And uh, what I want you to get from this message this morning is this. Only those characterized by obedience to the commands of God are spiritually related to Christ and qualified to enter the kingdom of heaven. Let me say that again. Only those characterized by obedience to the commands of God are spiritually related to Christ and qualified to enter the kingdom of heaven. So as you consider your life as a Christian and perhaps as you look at other people who claim to be Christians, how do you know they're Christians? How do you know they're truly in the family of God? In our Western culture, uh, Christianity is very shallow. Uh, Chuck Colson said Christianity in America is 2,000 miles wide and two inches deep. It's very superficial. Uh, there is a doctrine called easy believism, uh, and that doctrine basically uh, surrounds the idea that if you've prayed a prayer to trust Christ, um, that, that automatically you're in heaven. Uh, and praying that prayer is important, um, but the question is, is, was that prayer sincere? Was that prayer mingled with repentance, turning from sin and turning to Jesus Christ as Lord. You know, just because you live in a Christian nation doesn't mean you're a Christian, right? We live in, really, America is a, a post-Christian nation, uh, but at one time it was considered a Christian nation, and people believe that, you know, it's 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 a God and uh, American flag, and, you know, that means you're okay. Um, it's just not the case. Um, just because you grew up in a family that attended church regularly, and, and maybe even now you attend church regularly, that doesn't mean you're a Christian. I heard a long time ago from a, a musical artist named Steve Green, uh, I'm sorry, Keith Green, different Green, Keith Green. He says, being in, um, being in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than being in McDonald's makes you a hamburger, right? You may have heard it the other way that would be, being in a, uh, a garage doesn't make you a car, right? Um, so. You get the point, right? Just because you grew up in a Christian family doesn't mean you're a Christian. Just because you've prayed a sinner's prayer um, doesn't mean uh, that that you're a Christian, right? We do people a disservice when we strong arm, the, arm them into praying a prayer. Um, certainly, we want people to be saved, and certainly, uh, you know, that moment of salvation entails crying out to God, right? All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. There is a prayer of repentance. There's a prayer of salvation. But just because you've uttered those words does not mean uh, that you are saved. And just because you're baptized, just because you're baptized doesn't mean you're saved, doesn't mean you're a Christian either. Uh, plenty of people have, you know, gone into the water a sinner and they're going to come out a sinner. Uh, they're just a wet sinner. Uh, baptism is no guarantee that you're in the family of God, that you're a Christian. A Christian, friends, is a person who has turned from their sins They've embraced Jesus Christ as the Messiah, and they now live a life characterized by obedience to the commands of God. Let me say that again. A Christian is a person who has turned from their sin. They have repented. And as they turn from their sin, they're now embracing Jesus as the Messiah, the Lord, and they're living a life characterized, characterized by obedience to God's commands. I'm not saying they're not living a perfect life, but the, the bent of their life, the desire of their life, is to obey the commands of God. Now, as we look at Jesus this morning in Matthew chapter 12, he's addressing people, the Pharisees specifically, 
who believe they're in the spiritual family of God just because they've been born of Abraham. Now, certainly it was a great privilege to be of the lineage of Abraham, but they were under the, the mistaken notion that because they were, they could, they could trace their uh, lineage back to Abraham, that they were good. They were going to be in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus was trying to say, look, no, 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 that's, that's not what gets you into the kingdom of heaven. Right, and Jesus also here is addressing um, his relationship with his family, right? That even though they are related to Jesus by blood, that does not mean they're on the inside. That does not mean that they automatically get entrance into the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus here helps us to understand what it takes to get into the kingdom of heaven. Let's look at the passage now. And again, Jesus, um, in Mark's account, Jesus is just, a, he's just cast out a, a demon and he's being addressed by uh, his, his opposition here. Um, and in Matthew 12, we're going to begin at verse 46, though. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Now, we know from Mark's account that the people are saying that Jesus is going crazy. He's saying crazy things. Um, and, and they're concerned for him. So they send for Mary and, and Jesus' siblings there. So while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brother stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are, out, are standing outside wanting to speak to you. Jesus replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mothers and brother. Here, here are my mother and my brothers. And then he finishes with this very pointed statement. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So just a couple points I want us to consider this morning. Um, really kind of a tangential point, but I think I need to address it just because it comes up. Is that Jesus is not denying having a biological family. Here in this passage when Jesus says... Um, who is my mother and who are my brothers? He's not denying that he has a biological family. All right, the Roman Catholic Church teaches the perpetual virginity of Mary. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that Jesus had no true blood brothers or sisters, and that simply is not true. All right, we know from other places like Matthew's Gospel that we're looking at now, Matthew 13, verse 54, right? We read this, coming to his hometown, Nazareth, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked. Isn't this the carpenter's son, Joseph? Okay. Isn't his mother's name Mary? Aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? Right, and, and so the Roman Catholic Church would teach that these were Joseph's children from a previous marriage. And it just simply isn't the case. Um, Jesus had blood relations. He had brothers and sisters. Mary was not perpetually a virgin. Uh, Joseph did abstain from relations with her. According to Matthew's Gospel, he did abstain from relations uh, with Mary until after she gave birth to Jesus. And so uh, that we have to just eliminate that and get that out of the way. Jesus is not denying a biological family. What is Jesus doing here? Well, Jesus here is, is um, identifying who his spiritual family is. In this passage, uh, Jesus is identifying who his spiritual family is. And he answers that in the text. He says, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my mother, is my brothers, is my spiritual family. So here we see that obedience to God is the primary evidence of one who is a child of God, right? If you're a child of God, you're in the spiritual family of God, then you are related to Jesus as he defines it here in this passage. All right, so the question before us is, uh, really, is how do you know if you're truly saved? How do you know if you're truly in the spiritual family of God related to Jesus Christ spiritually? Well, we know from another gospel, the gospel of John, that if a person is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven, if they're going to be in the spiritual family of God, then they must be born again, right? John chapter 3, you must be born again. And I'm not going to spend a long time there. I'm going to spend more time kind of defining what it means to be born again into the family of God. But that's John's gospel. Let's go back into Matthew's gospel and see what Matthew says 
about being a part of this spiritual family that Jesus claims will enter into the kingdom of heaven, right? So, yes, a person must be born again into that family, right? But a person is born again when they repent of their sin and place their faith in Jesus as the Messiah alone for their salvation. That's, that's kind of the path that Matthew takes in talking about those who are in the spiritual family of God. Uh, Matthew doesn't talk a lot about what it means to believe or what it means to be saved, okay? He talks about the evidences of those who are saved, really. And so we see here the first thing is faith, right? If you're going to be in the spiritual family of God, you have to have faith, you have to believe. And where do I get that from in Matthew's Gospel? Well, we're going to see um, in Matthew chapter 16 that Matthew takes that turn towards uh, defining who the Messiah is and that you must believe in that Messiah to be saved. Right in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus is with his followers, his disciples. They're at Caesarea Philippi. Jesus has kind of taken them away from the crowd to teach them a lesson, to ask them a few questions. Jesus, it says in the text here, uh, Matthew 16, 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Well, Jesus turns again and says, well, what about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven and I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it and so Peter correctly identifies Jesus as the Messiah Peter believed in Jesus as the Messiah and really to enter into the family of God the spiritual family of God you have to rightly recognize who Jesus Christ is as the Messiah and Peter did that and then Jesus goes on to say that the entire church all those who would follow the apostles to be a part of the family of God would have to believe in the same message, right? There in verse 18, it says, And I tell you that you, Peter, uh, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. What is the rock that the church is going to be built upon? Some would say it's Peter. And yes, he did preach that first sermon at Pentecost that people believed on the message and turned in repentance. Uh, um, 3,000 people were saved that day. Yes, Peter's very important in the establishment of the church, but that rock there is the message that Jesus is the Messiah. The message of Jesus as the Messiah is the message that the church is built on and is the message that people have to believe to enter into the spiritual family of God, to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So, if you want to be a part of the spiritual family of God, you have to have faith in Jesus as the Messiah. And, and a part of having faith is repenting. Right, because um, a person apart from Christ is believing in one thing. They're believing in their own way. Perhaps they're believing in their own way in a, in a different God or a different Savior. Okay, but they're believing in their own way. And then they hear the message of the gospel. All right, that Jesus is the only way, that he is the only Messiah. And they turn from that way and they turn from those evil deeds and they turn to Jesus. They repent. And that's a part of faith, right? You're turning from something to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And so that repentance is demonstrated by obedience to the commands of God, which in turn reveal that you are a part of the spiritual family of God. Right? Repentance is a turning. And repentance is, is shown to be true by works. And I'm not saying that a person does works to be saved. I'm saying if they're saved, they're going to bear the fruit of repentance. And that's what John says, uh, the precursor to Christ. He says, look, you need to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, it's important in Matthew's gospel here, um, as, we, as we transition from Matthew 12 to Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, Jesus teaches the parables of the kingdom. The parables of the kingdom really are parables that show us Okay, what are people who enter into the kingdom of heaven, what are they going to be characterized by? What is the kingdom of heaven going to be like? All right, and so in Matthew 13, Jesus says, look, if you are spiritually related to me, if you are part of the family of God, then you're going to bear fruit. 
right? The very first parable, and I believe the most important parable, is the parable of the soils. Four soils are described by Jesus. I'm not going to get there because you're going to get taught that in the next couple of days. But four soils are described by Jesus Christ, and only the fourth soil that bears fruit, right? So there's this visible manifestation of life, okay, and it's fruit. And so if a person has placed their faith in Jesus as the Messiah, and they've repented of their sins, then their life is going to bear fruit. Their life, the soil, is going to bear fruit thereby showing that they are related to Jesus Christ spiritually, that they are in his spiritual family. Well, I think another telling passage that really helps us to understand what a true Christian looks like, somebody who's truly embraced Jesus Christ as Messiah, really goes back to the Sermon on the Mount, this ground that we've already covered, but two little sections there I think are important for us to understand what it means for a person to be a part of the family of God, somebody who is spiritually related to Jesus Christ. All right, and so Matthew chapter 7 Verse 21, Jesus says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Right? Not everybody who prays the sinner's prayer, saying that I am Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody who participates in church activities and sings songs about me is Lord. Not everybody who's participated in the Lord's Supper or been baptized, not, not every one of those people will enter into the kingdom of heaven. What does he say? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but, but only one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Does that sound familiar? Verse 22, many will say to me on that day, that day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Drive out demons in your name, perform many miracles. Then Jesus says, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Right? So Jesus says clearly, the identifying marker of somebody who's spirit related to him will enter the kingdom of heaven is somebody who obeys his teachings. Well, he tells another, he gives us another illustration right after that. And it's of the wise and foolish builders. There in verse 24. He says, therefore I tell you, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Right? Jesus says, look, if you're truly following me as Lord, you're going to obey my teachings. You're going to do the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus says, look, if you are my, if you are truly in the family of God, if you are my mother, my brother and sisters, if, if you are there, my spiritual family, then you will obey the commands of God as an evidence that you are in that spiritual family. So this morning, please don't be deceived. If you've grown up in the church, if you've been baptized, if you've prayed some prayer, this does not mean you're a Christian. You're a Christian if your life is characterized by repentance. It's characterized by a desire to obey Jesus over everyone else and everything else. That's the desire of your life. If you're recognizing Jesus as the Messiah, then you're going to have great confidence that you're in the spiritual family of God and that you'll enter into the kingdom of heaven. Again, the message this morning, only those characterized by obedience to the commands of God are spiritually related to Christ and qualified to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So, sobering words. Uh, we need to consider them as we look at our own life. And then also, as we look at the life of those in our families, people who claim to be Christians, yet their life denies their profession. So just a quick note, uh, for those of you who know me, my phone, my uh, messaging app has been on the blink. I've had to switch messaging apps. I may have missed a text or two that you sent me. If I have, please be merciful and patient with me and resend the text that I haven't responded to, and I'll be glad to get to that. Uh, two other things. One, uh, we're praying for Andre uh, Baker. His, his mother passed away over the weekend, and so we're going to uphold that family in prayer and then continue to pray for the Gubin family as Paul mourns the loss of, of his mother and plans uh, a memorial service for her. So, Grace, I'm so thankful for you. Uh, this morning and I'm so thankful for the privilege of being able to sit here in front of this camera and open up the Word of God with you. Uh, my prayer is that all of us will live a life that evidences obedience to the commands of God and proves that we truly are in His spiritual family and that we will enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you 
uh, for your word this morning. Thank you for the truths there uh, for us to understand and grapple with. Lord, help us this day uh, to live a life of love, to bear fruit, keeping with repentance that demonstrates that we truly are your children. Lord, I lift up Andre to you this morning and the rest of the family. Please comfort them uh, as they mourn, as they grieve the loss of, of their mother, their grandmother. Lord, be with Paul as he continues to mourn the loss of his mother. Lord, I pray that your grace would abound. Lord, that you would give Andre and Paul uh, words of grace to speak to their family members, that you would strengthen their families, and Lord, that the gospel will be clear in their conversation. We love you, Jesus. Help us to love you because of all that you've done for us, because of the love that you deserve as the Lord, as the Messiah. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, Grace, we love you guys. I love you guys. See you soon. Bye-bye.